So as a point of introduction, my name is uh, Jill Bierenbaum, and I'm Vice President for State Advocacy and Public Health for the American Heart Association. I'll start from that last point and move forward. Um, I'm, probably many of you are familiar with the American Heart Association. We're a voluntary health association really focused on building healthier lives free of cardiovascular disease and stroke for all Americans. Um, we've been around for nearly 100 years. Um, we have about 3,000 employees across the nation and very pleased to say have our national headquarters here in Texas in Dallas, which is where I live. I'm from Dallas, although I travel all over the country working in state legislatures. And my background is I've been in this role for about six years, kind of overseeing all of our government relations and, and public policy efforts in all the state capitals. And bef But before that, I was on the ground. I was in the trenches. I'm originally from the state of Minnesota. I worked for six years as a lobbyist in the state capital for the American Heart Association on the ground in Minnesota. And then before that, I worked um, for a number of corporations in the state of Minnesota as a lawyer and as a lobbyist in the Minnesota Soda State Legislature and in, in Congress for in the corporate environment. Um, so I've been doing this work for about 22 years and really my again my role is really public policy. I'll speak briefly about policy systems and environmental change. There are other tools that we have other than public policy to change policy to improve health. But again, my most, most of my focus is going to be on, I think what a lot of you are interested in is, is, is public policy, how we change laws in a way um, at the city level, as, as Jerrica said, at the state level or at the federal level uh, to improve um, health. If you haven't, um, and this is not, this is a concept that may be new to some of you, may not be new to, to some of you, but it's not necessarily a new concept of public health. This publication, Policy Environmental Change, New Directions for Public Health, if you're not familiar with it, it's, and it, even if you are, you may not, I, I, it's hard to realize, it's over a decade old. We've been thinking about how we use policy systems and environmental change to improve health for well over a decade, and quite frankly, implementing policy change to improve health for at least that amount of time. But to, if you're very interested in being a student of this effort, this, even though it's over a decade old, remains a, a really good publication. This policy environmental change came out from CDC, and I believe ASTO um, is a great primer on the role that public health, uh, well, the role of the public health community in, in policy systems and environmental change. And again, I'll focus on public policy, again, changing laws, but there are many other types of policies that we can, that we can change uh, that, first of all, in and of themselves improve health and also can be um, sometimes our starting point for the work that we do in broader public health. I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we're doing right now. A lot of our work, uh, uh, one of our areas, I'll get a little bit into our detail of the policies that we work to advance, but one of our new areas of focus is on the issue of sugar sweetened beverage consumption. Um, we see a lot of disparities when it comes to, sh to, to um, intake of sugar-sweetened beverages in certain communities and disparities with regard to obesity that exist as a result and disproportionate amount of, of cal caloric intake happening in some populations through sugar-sweetened beverages. And so we just work to change the policies in all the hospitals in the city of Boston so that now the hospitals in Boston no longer will sell sugar-sweetened beverages. We didn't have to change any laws to do that. Um, but but it was just up to the hospital administrators to decide they were no longer going to offer sugar sweetened beverages for sale in the hospitals. But we're, and that was an important, in and of itself, that is an important policy change. Again, not public policy, but private organizational policy that we work to change sugar sweetened beverage accessibility to sugar sweetened beverages in, in, that, in that venue. But now we're also leveraging that opportunity for policy change in hospitals to have the city of Boston hopefully we're working on it and through their procurement strategy it's called they're, they're buying uh, their ability to, to make decisions about what they buy for the city of Boston working to change through public policy the procurement um, decisions for the city of Boston will also be working hopefully to increase you through that through this first effort now increasing the price of sugar sweetened beverages in the city of Boston through a, sh a tax on sugar sweetened beverages and then ultimately we hope to go to the state of Massachusetts and ask for those same things for the state of Massachusetts to no longer purchase sugar sweetened beverages um, in, in, uh, in government owned buildings as well as again to increase the price of sugar sweetened beverages um, uh, through excise taxes. So again, policy doesn't necessarily have to come through public policy. It can be um, done again at the organizational or other, other levels, but again, often we leverage those other policies ultimately towards um, public policies and always with, as it says here, 
really trying to change the environment. Um, change, you know, we've done this very well in tobacco. I'm going to guess some of you, any of you come out of tobacco wars, worked on tobacco issues. Um, one of the things I, when I talked to my colleagues yesterday and they was, told them where I was going today, they said El Paso, I, when I said El Paso, they said make sure you congratulate the good folks of El Paso for their great work, a decade old of work um, of being smoke free here. As you know, we didn't go smoke free in Dallas, I think, until I think we passed it in 2008. And darn it, I'm spending a whole heck of a lot of money still trying to change that state law in Texas, and we're hoping in 2013. But you guys were well over a decade before the rest of the state with regard to protecting um, your community from the dangers of secondhand smoke. And as we've learned very well, those policies really do begin to change the overall community, the health of the community directly. You know, we know, for example, heart attacks go down after we pass smoke-free air laws. There are those direct health in, uh, Im impacts that we make through those policy changes, but we also know, again, that we change social norms. We change um, the way people view cigarette smoking. And again, with that example of sugar-sweetened beverages, we're now just on the cusp of beginning to change, hopefully, public attitudes, public policies with regard to sugar-sweetened beverages, so they're no longer I as accessible as they are uh, to the populations that we would like to impact. To get a little bit about what I do, this is where I play. I play in state legislatures all over, all over um, the country. I'm very fort oop, went the wrong way. Very fortunate. I have about 80 staff. We work in all 50 state capitals. My work is really to oversee that work in all those 50 state capitals. We're focused in eight areas, and I'm not going to get into the details of the policy. I'm going to focus more on how we work systematically to change public policy. I'm not going to get into these policy details, but would be more than willing if, if any of these areas of policy development are of interest to you, you know, in the question session or um, during lunch, be more than willing to talk about some of the specific things we do in, the, in these areas. But we work on everything from obesity prevention. I mentioned some of the sugar-sweetened beverage work we're doing. We're also working on things like menu labeling, physical education in schools, the built environment, um, shared use agreements for schools, a lot of um, work in the obesity realm. It's probably where we spend the vast majority of our time, but we also again work on tobacco prevention, funding for heart disease and stroke prevention, health care, access, cost, and quality. A lot of our work right now, um, as Jerrica said, is on implementation of health reform in states. The issue of the essential health benefits, she mentioned the health exchanges, but there are issues around what the essential health benefit set will be. Every state will now, unfortunately HHS was supposed to do this, they've kind of punted to the states. Every one of our states is now going to have to look at those private health insurance products they make available, um, to all, hopefully to all citizens, and what will be the essential health benefits, those benefits, you know, the very least that those insurance products make available in each state. Because you think about it, even if we give access to everybody to health insurance, but that health insurance is so poor, you know, if it costs you $20,000 out of pocket to go see your doctor, you know, if that insurance product is so poor, we've essentially um, eliminated the benefits of the access that we've provided. So there's going to be a lot of work in the coming years with regard to, again, just even the benefit set. Should people have just essential preventive benefits? And if they do, what should those look like? Does tobacco cessation counseling meaning we'll pay for the patch, or does it mean that you get group counseling? Those are the kind of decisions that are now going on in states with regard to the exchanges. As as well as, I know that we have some advocates here for Medicaid. That's another place where there's a lot of decisions being made by Medicaid directors now with regard to what that product will look like. Not only just access, who will be covered by Medicaid, but again, also, even if you have coverage, we want to make sure that that coverage um, is meaningful, that it, that it provides the essential benefits that people need at an affordable price so that they have, um, ultimately, they're able to take advantage of that increased access. We also work a lot in acute cardiovascular care, probably of less interest to some of you, but things like making sure that uh, acute stroke treatment happens, acute heart attack treatment happens, and actually it's an it's a, it's a important health equity issue for us. Right now there are disparities with regard to care and emergency care. Um, African Americans that have stroke, we're not necessarily getting the same treatment um, as those um, who are not African American, and what our work in this area does is assure that we utilize guidelines and evidence-based treatment um, to assure that, sorry, I'll try to get rid of that for you. I don't know how, there. 
um, to make sure that we apply uh, consistent treatment across all patients with acute stroke or acute heart attack or acute out-of-hospital cardiac arrest to, again, eliminate those disparities that now exist with treatment and that everybody has access to time-critical treatment um, in a consistent way across the country. We also do a lot of work around surveillance data collection, again, health equity, opposites of minority health, eliminating health disparities initiatives in states. Texas has had a, a relatively um, small, uh, kind of some small funding to do some eliminating health disparities work. I'm not as familiar with the Texas program, um, but uh, there are a few states, for example, the state of Minnesota where I'm from, that they fund eliminating health disparities initiatives at a, at a pretty high level, and our work is to hopefully begin to replicate that work um, uh, in other states that, for eliminating health disparities initiatives. And finally, charitable giving and some nonprofit issues we work on. The framework that I'm going to use to kind of do my presentation today is this one. This is what, how we do our planning within the American Heart Association. And it's really, it goes, um, it's, it's pretty much, we go across this continuum, although sometimes we have to uh, move backwards and forwards a little bit. Um, and I'll keep referencing this, but again, I'll do it kind of in the order that we often take our work. And again, these slides will be available to you after if this is a framework that you ultimately want to bring back to your coalitions and your work to thinking about the planning um, and the work that you do um, in uh, public policy change. So it starts out with, as, as I said before, that, state co that coalition work that you're going to do. It's that planning and stakeholder development. It's really defining the problem. And again, I really believe in the, the power of people coming together. Um, this, is, this is an important part of the process, forming your coalition. First, again, even just defining what your problem is that you want to solve, convening your stakeholders, getting the right people around the table, um, really thinking through, again, if, we're, if obesity is an issue, what are the barriers to people no, no longer being obese within our, within our community? Is it, our, is it physical education um, issues? Is it food deserts? You know, there are a variety of different policy things um, to look at in terms of the barriers within your communities for people to live healthier lives. So it's really, this stage of it is really, again, defining that problem, bringing people around the table. And I believe it's, a, it's really critical. It's actually where, at least in theory, I, I haven't been as involved with the community transformation grants as I wish that I had the time to be. But it's in many ways the theory at the beginning of the community transformation grant work, if you're familiar with it, where it's really about that leadership group that comes together again. We know what strategies we want to prioritize prioritize in the community transformation grants or in the, the previous communities putting prevention to work um, grants. We know what we want to do, but again, every community needs to sit down and define its problems for itself. What are the specific barriers that again exist for improving health in your communities, defining those problems. And then the second step though is identifying the solutions. And those solutions, again, um, I happen to be in, I'm going to be talking about those strategies being policy systems and environmental change. There may be some other strategies, other programs or things that you would want to prioritize. But often the, it, often the barrier often becomes public policy. Again, you know, our, our constituent, our, our, the people that we want to protect are being exposed to secondhand smoke. How do we eliminate exposure to secondhand smoke? Identify the solution, which is we want to pass a smoke-free air law um, in our community. It's really that time where, again, you think about um, you know what are the laws that need to be changed who are the people that influence who are the decision makers is it that we need to go to the city council is it that we need to go to the county commission do we need to go to the um, school board do we need to go to the state legislature or god forbid these days have to go to congress to make that change um, it's much harder to do and i will tell you um, most of our good work in public health often starts, starts at the community level and moves up but again, this stage is really identifying what's your solution. It's often writing the policy. You often need some experts around the table at this stage. But again, I think you're probably going to find there are many in, in local public health and, and in some of your um, voluntary health associations and other places, lobbyists and others that can come and help you a little bit with this part. This is also the part where, again, you do that statutory change, where you think about what is the actual language that we'd have to change um, in that law. It's also actually, too, uh, I'm going to get a little bit into evaluation for those that you, of you who are um, public health practitioners. This is also the stage where you want to really think about evaluation, uh, when you really want to define the metrics, the, the things you want to measure. Um, so again, if it's secondhand smoke exposure, is there any way that you can, exp that you can measure? Um, think about your surveillance or your, your data collection systems within your with community or state or federally where you can really look at, um, again, defining what success looks like, seeing if you have ways to measure that success so that um, sometimes people wait to think about evaluation until 
until after their policy is passed. So again, for those of you who are working in public health, I would encourage you to think about um, this is the stage where it's really critical to think about your ultimate plan for evaluation. Again, so you can establish your baseline, think about your data collection systems, um, think about uh, the, you know, epidemiologists or others who may be in your community or in your state who can help you with this phase. Um, because again, ultimately, um, I'll talk a little bit about the importance of, e of, of evidence in public health to make decisions about the, the priorities that we um, want to promote. But unless we're evaluating the impact of our work, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily something we're going to be able to replicate. Uh, the other thing to think about, here are some quest other questions. So we, those are some of the first questions we think about um, in our work, but here's some that are specific to AHA, and uh, I, I give them to you more. Um, you may or may not want to take them back to your organizations, but there are also other considerations that you need to make in terms um, of the decisions you make about what you want to prioritize. Again, this is the list that we use um, to determine, um, and I'm going to just focus on a couple of them. Uh, the first, um, it, you know, is it aligned with your organizational priorities? That one's uh, pretty easy. The second one is, and this will go a little bit again when we talk about the issue of policy briefs and things like that, is does the, in this case at my organization, the AHA have sound science and or a policy statement to guide our advocacy efforts? Uh, because the one thing that we want to make sure that we're doing with whatever we do, if we're going to expend precious um, resources on trying to change laws, and sometimes it takes a lot of money um, and, and sweat equity um, to change laws, um, do we know what we're going to do is going to make a difference? And again, the good news is there are a number of different resources out there, the community guide being one of them, as well as others, where you can really go out and see, you know, is there a, a kind of a science basis, kind of an evidence base, either evidence-based or evidence-informed, um, in order to make those decisions about the policies that you may want to, to prioritize. But that's something in particular for my organization with where we have decent resources but not um, uh, all the resources in the world I wish that we have where we really ultimately prioritize those things um, that have the most sound science. So it's why tobacco often um, rises to the top because we know, for example, again, in, in uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, smoke-free air laws. We began to see very early on again those reductions in heart attacks. Um, we're about to, we just had an abstract at our scientific sessions just about to be released in a peer-reviewed journal that showed that in uh, Minnesota after our smoke-free air law passed in Olmstead County, Minnesota, which is the home of the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, they saw 40 45% reduction in heart attacks and a 50% reduction in, um, in, uh, in sudden cardiac arrest, so sudden death, so the, those electrical disturbances. So as the author of that said, if I, if I developed a treatment, a device, um, or a drug that reduced heart attacks by 45% and sudden cardiac arrest by 50%, I would win the Nobel Prize. You know, so it's one of those things where it's why we choose to prioritize it with our precious resources. Again, there's no doubt from a science and evidence perspective um, that we save lives. We keep heart attacks from happening in the first place. Um, we also do a lot of work to make sure if people have heart attacks, they're treated in a way, again, that's appropriate and timely. But also, again, um, uh, what we're very proud of our work in advocacy is we keep them from happening in the first place. Um, I'll talk next about probably the part that um, I find the most fun. Again, I'm a lobbyist. I like to live in the Capitol. I actually didn't know who the Speaker of the House was in Texas, and I, I was like, really? I've forgotten that. But when you have 50 <laughs> states, um, it gets a little hard sometimes uh, to, to keep track. But this is sometimes where we have the most fun. It's that legislative part of the campaign. This is when we get to deal with elected officials. Anybody here really like elected officials? Okay. I, I kind of like them. Um, I get to hang out with them, and sometimes it can be fun, but most of the time it's a real pain. Um, but this, uh, like I said, is often um, the fun part of the work. This is the part where you get to get into the trenches. As I like to f say, you can't win a fight unless you pick a fight. And this is the part where you get to pick a fight, when you really get to go show up, um, make your case be known, and hopefully um, change minds. Uh, there are a lot of aspects um, to this work. I'm going to focus a little bit on some of the planning, the ways that we plan for, these, the, uh, for this work. There are many different models out there. If, if, um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail only for the sake of time, but would encourage you, again, if, if you're looking for resources to bring back to your coalitions, um, if there's anything the AHA can do and help, help you in terms of training or find you resources to do it, again, I'll show you a couple of models, that the things that we use, uh, my AD staff um, use for our uh, 
for our training and for some of our approaches. Um, again, not at a level where I think it w will make you an expert, but, but will introduce you um, to these tools. And again, if, if you're inspired to bring them back to your groups, let me know and I'll do what I can to help. So we use what's called the Midwest Academy planning model. Anybody here ever heard of the Midwest Academy? Good. Direct action organizing. Midwest Academy became really big thanks to the good work of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and our work when we had smokeless states money uh, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. They sent the Midwest Academy around to pretty much all 50 states. Every state tobacco coalition um, was, we got training, they, we were being sent to Illinois, Chicago, where they're located um, to get um, uh, trained in the Midwest Academy model, it turned into a great model for, for direct action organizing it for public health initiatives. Again, we used it first in tobacco, now we use it for everything that we do at the American Heart Association for our legislative planning um, uh, in our work. Again, it's that direct action organizing, it involves people. Um, we have, we work against a lot of powerful corporate forces, they don't have people. Well, they may get a few employees to show up at the state capitol or their CEO might show up, uh, but they have money. They can buy a whole heck of a lot of lobbyists. Um, they can um, buy, mem well, they don't buy, they, they give contributions to members of the legislature. They have, a, they have tools that we don't have. I can't, I'm a 501c3. I, can't, I can personally write a check, uh, but I also live in a nonprofit salary. Um, I can personally write a check, um, but I can't write one on behalf of my organization. When I, when I worked in the corporate world, I could. I actually helped form PACs for my, for my corporate um, clients at that point. It was really nice because I could then write a check from my PAC so that I could also go and bring my clients with to fundraisers and the food was really good. But, um, uh, but not as good as the lunch we're about to have, I'm sure. But uh, it was, it's, a, it's, it's a great tool to have, don't get me wrong. But what we have in public health is we have people. Uh, we have people, we have stories, we have passion. We also have science, um, uh, but you need both. Um, uh, science is a really good thing, um, but uh, people is really how we're, all, and also we actually want people involved too because we want people involved in the change, right? I mean, if we pass a smoke-free air line, nobody knows about it. It's not going to do us a lot of good. We want people really engaged in this process. So again, the sugar sweetened beverage taxes, I want people engaged in that because right now a lot, of a lot of people in the public don't agree with me on this issue. They don't think that sugar sweetened beverage consumption is really all that bad. Um, and so I want people involved in this change. I, I want those that are passionate about making the change involved. But I also want people involved even on the periphery, beginning to understand why this is a huge issue when it comes to obesity and how many of these companies are really targeting our children, uh, targeting certain neighborhoods, targeting certain populations. I really want people involved in that change so we begin to change the social norms um, that are involved in that change. But the most important part of the Midwest Academy model, it's all about power. So again, right now, trust me, I fight against the American Beverage Association, Coke, Pepsi, um, and Cadbury Shrubs. I'm not proud of that, but um, and believe, their tactics um, are no better than the tobacco industry. And I don't mean to say that those three companies are, they do business like the tobacco companies generally. I don't mean to say that. In the work that I do in the legislature, they are no different. They're buying scientists, they're buying members of Congress, they're buying lobbyists. They're very, very, very powerful people. They, have, they make incredible amounts of money and they want to continue making incredible amounts of money. And that's fine, that's their job. As again, a former corporate lo lobbyist, corporate attorney, um, they have a fiduciary duty to do that. That's their job. But again, I have to figure out a way to get power over both them as well as the elected officials that support them. And that's what the Midwest Academy, if done well, is meant to do. Um, Speaking about power, I, I put a lot of words up here, but again, more or less, so you can go back and look at it. There was just a really nice article. I don't usually read the Journal of Health Politics, Policy, and Law, but I'm about to. This was a really nice article that um, was all about the, the politics of prevention and why, quite frankly, we're not, it was just recently released, and why right now we're not necessarily making the progress, in particular on chronic disease, um, uh, prevention policy as we could, and a lot of it is really about power where we're really, where again, most of the time we are going up against these real, really powerful forces. They want no regulation. So another area that I work right now is sodium reduction. Very controversial. I don't have the public behind me on this either. Most people in the public, 
don't know that they know that salt's bad for them, but they have no idea how bad it is for them, in particular African Americans, as well as they don't know exactly. They're, we're consuming more than double the amount of sodium we're supposed to in, this, in, the, in the population. It's a huge issue. And where do you guys think sodium comes from? Most people think the salt shaker, right? OK. A lot of people think, right, processed and restaurant food, 70% processed and restaurant food. You can't, you can't take it out. So what I'm trying to do is give people choice, right? I want you to be able to add your own salt. The problem is it's already there in most of the things we're eating. There's nothing that anybody can do about it. And the forces that I'm going up against, so the forces you go up against in that are extremely powerful, and they make a whole heck of a lot of money. And they, again, I'm not against food. I love food. Um, but, you know, a cheese it a really good example, just, just to show you kind of how, uh, how much fun this work can be. A cheese it um, will not exist if, if I can do anything about it. And it's not because I have anything against cheese its <laughs> at all. But the reason why a cheese it without the sodium in it looks like a gray glop of dough that tastes like wet dog hair. I'm not kidding. Uh, there's an official from Nabisco or whatever, whatever the company is for cheese its was actually quoted in the New York Times saying this. So it's not me, it's them. So it's a glop of dough that tastes like wet, wet dog hair, and it's gray in color. But if you add enough sodium to it, it crisps up, it turns orange, and it tastes like cheese. If they begin to reduce the levels of sodium in a cheese it it's, it, it, it loses all of that. So that's the problem. There's so many products now that are out there in the processed, and quite frankly, even in the restaurant food environment, where they can hardly not even exist unless they have that amount of sodium. And again, I'm not, all of you eat what you want to eat. I'm not here to, <laughs> I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a nanny. But I'm just saying, you know, again, all, so much of our work in public policy is about power. It's about going against these very, very, very powerful interests that do not want to be told what to do by government. End of story. And they've convinced most of the public the government's bad, right? Government intervention bad, nanny state, all of that stuff. So again, so much of our work right now in public policy is about overcoming very, very powerful forces. And then I'll give you one last power quote. Um, this is my, by far my favorite because what the advantage though that we have that we're overcoming powerful forces, and we've seen this again in the tobacco fights, and we're going to do it on the sodium front, and we're going to do it in the obesity front, and then every other place where I'm, I'm taking on um, uh, powerful interests. There's also a lot to be said about the struggle though. Again, I hope today you've already come away from a little bit from hearing about my power struggle with sodium, a little bit more information that you can take back and think about some of the choices you make. Again, completely up to you. But again, there's something in the struggle against powerful forces where we also win in the struggle, um, where, where um, you know, there's, just, there's, there's a lot to be gained, both as individuals and helping to make this change, as well as what we can do for our communities by, again, taking on these, these powerful interests. And this is by far, I, this is um, on my desk. This is what I look at every day. Um, and it really, for me personally, defines what I do. So I'm talking about the Midwest Academy um, model. Again, this is going to be nowhere close to a a good training on it. It's more to let you know a little bit about what it's about. There's a great manual. You can buy it on Amazon um, if you want to look into it. It's a really good manual not only on this way of doing strategic planning. It also is really good on coalition development, coalition work, other work. And again, it's really about that direct action organizing, getting people engaged in our efforts and, and how we do it, as well as gaining power over those that have power. So that's really, that's kind of the, the theme of the Midwest Academy model. Um, and it's, it's actually, it looks simple on paper. It really is. It's a, it's a chart. It poses the necessary steps in a logical order and moves people through a planning process step by step. And I'll get a little bit more into it, it, into it but what I, where I really learned a lot from this, that, that, um, from this method, is that which of these columns do we normally start off with when we are thinking about doing a campaign? Tactics, right? We have to think, what's the what do we want to do first? Midwest Academy turns that on its head, and it was an aha moment for me. Because here I'm the, same, the type that's like, hey, let's do, a, let's do a day at the Capitol. Well, the Midwest Academy, you, you don't start there, you end there. You think first about how you're going to get power over individuals, and then, it, then you think about the tactics to get power. So I might want to do a day at the Capitol. It may seem like a good idea. But if it doesn't influence the people that I need to get power over, 
I've just wasted my time and precious resources. So it's a really good model where, again, most of the time we want to think about tactics. What are we going to do? That's the fun part, right, where you get to brainstorm and think about we're going to do this and that and this and that and this and that. And that's an important process. I don't mean to downplay that for in the least bit. Tactics are important. But tactics are only important when they're directed at the people that have power um, in terms of the decision making um, that we want to do. I'm um, going to skip that one. So the first place you start, obviously, is with your goals. What are your goals? Um, long-term, intermediate, short-term are often really important. Um, your long-term is obviously probably the health outcome that you want to drive. We want to decrease exposure to secondhand smoke in our community from 30% to 5%, you know, whatever the, the health outcome probably in, in, the, in your case that you want to drive. I'll start, that, so that's your long-term, and then I'll go next to short-term. Short-term are often those things, the one thing that we're really, really, really bad in the public health community is giving ourselves credit for success. The minute we get success, we often just move on to the next thing we want to do. So this is where your opportunity is to celebrate your smaller successes. What are the smaller successes, those smaller things you may want to accomplish? It may be getting 30 people in your coalition, or we 25 letters to the editor submitted. What are those shorter term things that you want to do? And then intermediate are probably things like the public policy change, or some, you know, it might be that we got smoke free restaurants pass, but then long-term is smoke-free bars. You know, it's just that, what is that kind of inter, intermediate thing? Um, it, and then just speak a little bit about internal issues. Those are things like organizational considerations, things that, um, you, that you have within your organizations that they bring. Allies and opposition, pretty, pretty easy to see. Those are the people that are going to be working against you. And then targets. I'm going to speak a little bit about targets. Again, most people, when they think about who they want to influence, they sometimes even think of, they either think about their friends or their enemies. And targets are not necessarily friends or enemies. Targets are the people that stand between you and what you want. So it could be the governor, because you know the governor's got to sign something. It could be the Speaker of the House, because the Speaker of the House controls whether or not something gets on the floor or not. It could be the president of the city council. Targets are always those people who can give you what you want. Again, they don't have to be your opposition. You know, Senator X may be the most vocal person against you, you, you know, but he doesn't stand on any committees that are really of influence for you. So I always think what, so the, the most important part of the Midwest Academy is you really, it really makes you think through who are the people who stand between you and what you want. And hopefully that list matches your capacity to influence them. Because sometimes, you know, if it's 15 people and you can only influence three of them, um, you may not be successful, but your targets, are, again, are always those people who stand between you and what you want. Your secondary targets are also important because those are the people that influence your primary decision makers. So those are people, as we were talking about earlier, things like when you, you write an op-ed because you're trying to influence the, perhaps the, um, the uh, uh, editor for the local paper and that editor of the local paper can influence your primary decision maker, things like that. Secondary um, uh, targets can also be spouses, pastors, they can be um, other members of the legislature that may have influence. So again, your, um, when you think about who your targets are, your primary decision makers, again, those are the people who stand between you and what you want. Talk about just a little bit about tactics, again, what we often want to do when we do advocacy is think first about tactics. Again, tactics are the last thing we do. So when we do planning for legislative work, we have figured out who stands between us and what we want. And now we think about what are the tactics that we want to use to gain influence over those people, gain power over those individuals. So I was working on a smoke-free air fight um, uh, in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. It's a suburb of, of Minneapolis. And we knew who our, our target was, fortunately, it was just one guy. We had one person uh, we needed to, to sway the vote one way or the other, so we only had one target. And we piled on. Every tactic that we had in that campaign was directed at him. We were organizing in his church. We found out his route that he took to, to work in the morning. Talk about bird dogging. We, we literally, we, did a, we, we didn't have enough signs to, to uh, uh, lawn signs to put in the whole city of Eden Prairie, so we found out the route that he took to work, and we walked his route to work, and we asked all his neighbors to put up signs in their yard, things like that. We talked to his spouse. We found out where he was employed. I mean, it really is. Your tactics in your campaign 
are really directed at your target. Yeah, we stalked him. I know, is that what I heard? Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And, 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 and here's another thing that I learned in public health that I had never thought of before. And this is what I, why I love working with public health advocates. Um, if a legislator tells you they've gotten enough, um, you know, a lot of times we use electronic means, right, to communicate with members. If they tell you to turn off um, the action alerts, what should you do? Turn them on, right? So it, 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 what, it was hard for me when somebody came and said, I'm sick of your people contacting me. You know, I, my first inclination, I'm a, a good Minnesota girl, we want to be nice to people, was like, oh, of course I'll turn them off. I'm not that way anymore. The one thing that, that working in this realm turned me into is that just makes me want to turn it on more. Because you think, you know, yes, you don't want to burn bridges to the point of where nobody will ever want to talk to you again. But like I said, we're working against extremely powerful forces. We've got to be able to convince people to do things that they don't want to do. And, and I'm not going to say, it's not by all means possible. I'm, I don't mean to imply that at all. But really, again, what this part of this exercise does is have you think about those tactics, those ways that you can get, again, at those people who stand between you and what you want so that you're not wasting your time on tactics and resources directed at people who either, you know, already are in your camp or, again, don't really stand between you and what you want. Uh, again, some of the criteria for good, uh, good tactics focused on the primary or secondary target, putting power behind a specific demand, meets your organizational goals, outside the experience of the target. Um, like I said, it's really thinking about catching that person's attention in a way that makes it really clear. We know who you, you are and we're not going to stop until um, we have your vote. Um, but it also has to be, as I said, within the, ex the experience and comfort of your members. You know, it can't be, you know, I work for the American Heart Association. We, we have a, a powerful brand. My organization's not going to let me do anything that will make it look bad, and I would never want to do that. But it also, obviously, you know, if you work for public health or something, it's probably got to be something where your, your organization's ultimately going to be comfortable with it. But again, uh, it's pushing the boundaries, um, making it clear that you're, you're after that, that individual. Um, these are just some things to, some questions to consider about your target. It's more to really understand who they are as people. Again, I won't go through them. You'll, you'll have the slides if you're interested in using it. But um, I'll give you an example of why these, these kind of questions about your target are very important. For example, the first question, um, what was his or her margin of victory in the last election? That can be very important because if the person won by 40%, do you really think that he or she is going to care what their constituents have to say? Probably not. And I hate to say that, but it's true. So you may have to think about different tactics. It may not be a grassroots campaign. It may be more of a grass tops, meaning he or she may care what their employer thinks or what their church pastor thinks, or there may be an other secondary targets that may be influential. But for example, margin of victory in the last election. But if they lost by 1% or won by 1%, they care a whole heck of a lot. You know, um, we had a campaign once where we did have somebody who won by like 400 votes. So we did the 401 campaign or something like that. It was like where we implied we had found, you know, 401 voters who had voted for him in the last election that said they wouldn't vote this time if he didn't vote for our smoke free air law. So that, that's the kind of information, really understanding who your target is, you know, so that you can, again, really gain power and influence um, over that, that individual. Oh, I'm gonna, next, I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about one other tool that I often, when I work with people who work in public health, um, find um, nice. And I'll go actually first to what this is, and then I'll get in a little more detail. It's called the, the power prism. One thing that we do get kind of um, things that we we do occasionally from time to time have things um, that come to us in public health that we don't always fully leverage. You know, a good example like even the the uh, HHS report on on health eliminating health disparities, things like that. There are so many things that we have that um, we we take advantage of this relatively well in tobacco. Every year, like we we'll get a report on you know what are the smoking rates in our state. Um, this is another tool I really like to use in advocacy planning because it gets at trying to have us take to really leverage and take full advantage of every opportunity that we have in advocacy. It's, again, it's called the power prism, and when you use it, is, um, and, 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 um, and anytime something happens, it can really be something, again, a report's going to come out, maybe Cinco de Mayo's tomorrow, <laughs> Christmas, you know, there may be, there's something going on. What this tool really does is it really helps a coalition again, really execute more fully on that opportunity than we often do. So again, sometimes when we have a report come out, we may just send out a press release, right? Okay, we sent out a press release, the press knows about it, great. 
But what this really does is it really asks you to take that opportunity, whatever it is, and think, really expand and think about what are the full range of opportunities of how we could leverage that, whatever that thing is. You know, again, a release of data, a day of the, you know, Na National you know, Minority Health Month, you know, whatever it is, to really think about whatever that opportunity is in a more comprehensive way. It's just more that we're getting more of a bang for our buck. And I see a lot of coalitions use um, this tool. So it's thinking about, again, if that, let's say, okay, we've got a report coming out tomorrow that's going to show that um, cancer rates in this county have gone, you know, up by 5%. So what you do is that report's coming up. You put it through the, through the um, prism and you say, what are opportunities to, might be building a broader coalition. It could be, you know, fundraising's a little uh, more problematic, but it's something all coalitions have to think about. Um, again, how are we going to utilize this report with our grassroots? How are we gonna use this report in the media? How are we gonna use it for lobbying? What are we gonna do with that report um, in terms of going to our city council or key decision makers? So again, it's, it's, a, it's, it's less um, complex than the Midwest Academy organizing model for thinking about legislative change. But again, it's something I often find that coalitions like to use again to really think more expansively about how to more fully leverage an upcoming opportunity. Okay, so that's a little bit on legislative. I won't spend as much time on regulatory uh, but it's an important aspect to think about, especially if you're working on statewide change. There's a lot, so legislative work, bless you, is, um, legislative work is, is, is working to influence elected officials. So again, all state legislators are elected officials. Legislative work is again using kind of electoral, you know, power that we have over them because they have to get reelected. That's what legislative um, re action is. You know, the city council, they're all elected officials. Again, the tools, the tactics, the things that you do there are more about how do we let them know they may not get reelected or their friends may not give them as much money or whatever they're influenced by. That's what that is. Regulatory, for those of you who may not be as familiar with it, or maybe many of you are, is the work that non-elected officials do, mostly in departments. So regulatory is like um, the state health department may promulgate some regulations. Actually, Texas has a pretty robust history of regulatory action when it comes to school policy. So you guys have uh, your competitive foods policy, for example, largely because I think it was uh, the Department of Agriculture here in the state of Texas chose to regulate um, competitive foods in schools, for example, in the state of Texas. We do a lot of work in the work we do in acute cardiovascular care and hospital-based care by changing e, uh, emergency medical services, EMS, regulatory work. So regulatory parts of, of it's probably used a little bit less and more primary prevention public health. Sometimes smoke-free air laws need to have some kind of regulatory component after. So for those of you who are, are doing this work, it's just something you need to think about. Is there anything after we get the bill passed? Or quite frankly, sometimes your state agencies may already have broad regulatory authority that will allow you to bypass. Again, in Texas, they bypass the, the Texas legislature for competitive foods because, the, again, the Department of Agriculture already had the broad prom ability to promulgate regulations. So sometimes you can even, again, bypass the legislature if, if, a, if a regulatory body in your, your state has the power to already do the work. Or you may have to go to the legislature, give them the power, and then, again, work to um, change those, those regulations after. But again, it's just something, especially if you're working on statewide and cer certainly federal. Almost, uh, you know, we got health care reform passed. But oh yeah, we've got all this regulatory work now that we're doing. You know, um, we talked about the, the um, Jerga talked about the comments and all that. That's all part of that regulatory process. All of that. So actually, I'll step back for a moment. So essentially what happens, again, if you get a law passed, the regulations are more the detailed work. So, you, so with health reform, it set up broad concepts for things that needed to be done. You must estab establish a health insurance exchange. The regulations are the detailed work that tell state agencies exactly what that means to do it. So often the, the, the administrative aspect of this, the, the state agencies or the federal agencies are considered the, the experts that kind of fine tune the work after. So again, it's, it can be very important. If you miss this part, again, if you, if you only work to pass health reform, if you're missing the regulatory phase, you're missing a lot of opportunities to influence policy. Because again, the uh, devil's often in the details, right? So a lot of the work right now that we're doing in health reform is in more this, this regulatory phase. The, again, it's one thing to say every health insurance plan should have an essential health benefit set. But the details of that essential health benefit set, again, are really will make the difference between whether that's a worthwhile product or not. So does that make sense? Yeah. That's what we put it in writing. 
Okay. Yep. Okay. So I'm going to talk next about implementation, and um, that was mentioned a, a little bit as well. Um, that's another place where we often fall short. So I'll give you an example. And frankly, my organization was not very good in the implementation phase for a long time either. We often celebrated, yay, we got that physical education law passed. Oh yeah, um, I was really proud of, they had a, a southern state, very proud of them about six years ago that passed statewide requirements for physical education at all levels. 150 minutes for middle school, 225 minutes a week for high for, um, I'm sorry, for 250 minutes per week for elementary school, 225 weeks of mandatory physical education in middle school. Southern state, very proud of themselves, huge obesity problem. They were very proud, we were very proud, got it passed, it was the right thing to do. How many schools are actually implementing it, do you think? Less than 10%. Now, don't get me wrong, that's at least 8% probably that weren't doing it before. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that. But we've got, we've, what we have figured out, um, I was at a, an obesity conference and, and with a bunch of obesity experts and I said, you know, if you could have my resources to do what you wanted, you know, what would you do? And a woman raised her hand and she said, I'd work on implementing the policies you've already passed. So you, th you, know, you think about competitive foods in schools. We're going to have, a, for those of you who are think about nutrition issues, you've got great new federal laws with regard to the school lunch program and the competitive food environment. But school, we're going to have to expect schools now to implement that. And there's going to be accountability and stuff that we're going to have to do in this phase. So this is the phase where, it's, as, as was said earlier, it's don't just celebrate and move on to the next thing. There's this whole now stage of making sure that it's being implemented correctly, implementing consistently with the, the health outcomes that we wanted to drive, with the way that the policy was written. Um, and again, I'm probably going to have just as much work to do in that southern state to now, how the heck do I hold those 92% of schools accountable? who aren't following the law, who aren't giving physical education to their kids, now I've got a lot of work to do to figure out how I'm going to close that gap from 8% to probably never 100%, uh, but at least getting as close to 100% as I can. But it's, again, when you're, you're sitting down your coalition, you're thinking about public policy change, this, this can be a really important aspect, again, especially for statewide, because if you run out of resources at the point of passage, again, you may have a bit of a hollow victory if you don't think right from the beginning about how you're going to assure that. And then the final phase is, again, the evaluation aspects. And again, for those of you who are working in public health, uh, this, this is exceptionally um, important for all of you. It's really thinking, again, about how we um, report on the progress that we've made through that policy change, essentially. Hopefully also that we're adding to the, to the literature and the evidence and, you know, publishing and peer-reviewed journals and all of that as well. But it can just be as simple as, again, just as having mechanisms where we're, where we're reporting on the progress that we're making. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples um, of some of the work that we do at AHA in evaluation. Again, in our, in our acute work in stroke and in, 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 in heart attacks, we actually have data collection systems. So we can actually report, like after we passed a primary stroke center law, we, could, we then look at the data and see, did we actually um, increase the number of patients that got appropriate treatment as a result? Um, another way that a lot of states do this in, in physical education is with statewide report cards. So California, actually Texas has the fitness gram now, I guess, too, as well, right? So that can be, and again, put that through the power prism when you have your fitness gram results come out, because um, those results of how you're doing with fitness, again, how you're evaluating the impact of hopefully policy or lack of policy um, is another way. So again, California has been doing it the longest, where they can actually show and demonstrate on an annual basis what their, their fitness is. Um, again, we do it in, in heart attacks and smoke-free policy, excise tax. There's many ways where you can evaluate, not only to evaluate, to again, look at the, it, to contribute to the overall understanding that we have of the impact of public policy, but again, to really utilize um, your evaluation as a way to continue to remind legislators that there's more work to be done, or quite frankly, to demonstrate that, by the way, you know, we told you that if you pass that smoke-free air law, you were going to reduce heart attacks, and look, you did. You know, Congressman or Representative so-and-so, you know, you have now saved as many lives as most cardiologists will just by passing that law. So it's, it's that kind of thing. Evaluation can be really important to think about. You've already designed your evaluation up front in your early stages, and now you're both reporting, hopefully getting the progress that you thought you'd achieve, as well as utilizing that probably, hopefully, uh, for further advocacy. Um, I'm going to skip some of this. Uh, I'm going to leave lots of time for questions. If you're interested 
in the policy work that we do at the American Heart Association in any of these ways, we, we brand our work, we call it the You're the Cure Network. We really want um, folks who are engaged with the American Heart Association to feel that they're part, again, they're, they feel that they are part of what we call the cure. Um, we know that we'll probably never cure heart disease, uh, but we want to be aspirational. We want our folks to feel like they're part of something, that they're part of, for an, like our example, the cure. So we call it a You're the Cure Network. So if you're interested in being part, of the Year of the Care Network. We work mostly, um, we have an office in DC. We do work on federal policy. Again, my work is in the 50 state capitals, but we also um, do some work locally, in particular in larger metro areas. So um, uh, you could uh, potentially get engaged um, with work we do at that level as well. So with that, that's my contact information, as I said. I didn't go into a lot of detail with some of the planning work. Like I said, it was more or less not to um, some of you uh, may be less um, in, um, involved in the, at that level, but again, if I can, if me, if I can, or my organization can be a resource to you, to your coalitions, to your work in, um, you know, the Midwest Academy training in and of itself is a week-long training in Chicago. We do a condensed version as well, but just to give you a sense of the, the depth of, of how that training in and of itself can be uh, for practitioners of that. Um, so if we can be a resource in terms of your work at the Texas Legislature, your work here in El Paso, your work federally, your work in, in your own coalitions and your orga own organizations, there's uh, my contact information in Dallas. So stop there and see any questions about policy systems and environmental change, knowing I'm standing between you and lunch. Yes. Can I just have so much questions at this two points that I want to Please. I'm sorry, I'll try to talk real fast. Is that we mentioned tobacco a lot and the nutrition aspect and just understanding that connection that tobacco also learned a lot from their own process because they control a lot of the food networks also like I believe it's through, they're all pre branded, they own craft foods and what have you. So just like they're having to learn how to go against their strategies, they're learning how to improve their things and because mm -hmm. they're in essence connected industry wise. Yep. And also my second point was that I think a lot of times our challenge in public health is the funding that does become available to us through grants or what have you is maybe one year, two years, and is very tax tactic oriented in that they want to see policy outcomes and expectations, yet sometimes the funders or the yeah. funding source don't understand the level of work that has to happen beforehand to understand what the end should be. Yeah. So I think we kind of have that disconnect in just that we need to better understand the policy system and that just because I didn't end my quote unquote program or my funded project with a, an ordinance or a policy, it doesn't mean the policy was proven and change didn't happen. Yeah. No, I agree. It, you know, the thing about what we're trying to do, for example, in OBC, we're trying to create a movement. You know, we know if we just pass a, sm uh, a physical education law, that's not going to be enough. Or if we just, even if we just pass a smoke-free air law, that's, that's not enough. I mean, and for, if you can do it in one year, great. But yes. Um, um, you know, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard it sometimes takes up to seven years to pass something federally. It, you, usually for my staff, we do three-year planning uh, to pass laws. If, I, if my staff can do something at the state legislature in less than three years, but smoke-free Texas, we've been working for a decade, right? So, you know, it can take that long. I just actually very proud of, uh, this is a smaller law. It's changing the Good Samaritan law in New Jersey. We changed all the Good Samaritan laws so that if somebody uses an automated external defibrillator, they get Good Samaritan law coverage. Seems simple. We've done it in all 50 states, except we had a change that we needed to make in New Jersey. My staff that worked for seven years and got it passed today, um, got that email. We're very proud of them. It can sometimes take that long. This is perseverance. And, and we, get, we can get so defeated, you know, if we lose. Or yes, our funders may go away. You know, we're fortunate to have some major funders like the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and others that are more sophisticated, but government funders, yes. I mean, CTGs, hopefully, you know, those are three years, things like that. We, we're starting to see more sophistication to some extent of that understanding of the time that it takes, that perseverance, that, you know, we got to keep coming at them, you know, keep coming at them, keep coming at them. And with your first point of, you know, the power, the power of industry, some of it is that their own, these companies are owned by the same people. Often it's they're using the same influencers to make decisions. So we're, again, seeing a lot of the same tactics of the tobacco industry in the obesity work that we're doing by the food industry because they're using the same firms, the same lobbyists, the same PR agencies, the same firms, the same tactics, um, you know, the same kind of uh, strategies. You probably, I don't know if you've seen some of these attacks now on CPPW. 
these attacks on community transformation grants, that they're slush funds, that they're, that they're being used for lobbying, even though we've been very careful. We know what the line is between lobbying and non-lobbying, and we're not spending government funds to do it. But they're going to attack us on that. The tobacco industry did the same thing. You know, Minnesota, we had uh, statewide, you know, $20 million a year of, of state um, funding that went to local coalitions, probably you have similar funding in, in Texas where it goes to local coalitions to do organizing our own policy systems, environmental change. We all know how to spend those dollars and when we need to get our NGOs and those that can spend money on lobbying. And yet again, we're being attacked for using those dollars as lobbying. Same thing in tobacco, again, because they're using the same people, same PR firms, same tactics. Um, that, that we saw tobacco because it's the, it's, they, it, it'll, they know it'll work. And actually, one other strategy too, this has been very interesting to watch on the sugar sweetened beverage front. The other thing the tobacco industry ver did very well was it bought allies. And we're seeing this now in, in nutrition where um, in, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, the American Beverage Association gave the Department of Health $10 million to get Mayor Nutter to no longer do a sugar sweetened beverage tax. Fortunately, they said no to it. When the Department of Public Health said no to it, they gave it to a hospital, which unfortunately accepted the $10 million. But essentially, it's a $10 million bribe to not do a sugar sweetened beverage policy. When um, con uh, City Council me member Cipperman in Cleveland um, wanted to do a sugar sweetened beverage tax, the Beverage Association showed up and offered to build, I think, 10 rec centers in his district if he didn't do it. So it's the same kind of tactics where, again, you know, you try to make the stuff go away and then hope that the public health advocates take their eye off the ball and we move on to the next thing that we want to work on. And I'm, I'm hopeful we don't do that. So, Other questions, comments? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's, you've already started down the road. So we go, th our process, um, so if, if you ever get engaged with the American Heart Association or want to, we have a state advocacy committee, for example, for the state of, of Texas, if you ever, um, how we make decisions is we start off first with an environmental assessment, an assessment of all these different eight issue areas where we look each issue by each issue. What, you know, again, where are we now with the law? Where do we want to be with the law? It's first that assessment. What is the, the, the kind of the full range of targets, essentially? What, what all do we need to change within, in this case, the, the state? So we first do an assessment process. Then we do an agenda setting process. And that's where exactly we have to ask those type of questions. It's really looking at the political environment. We we're very fortunate that we have, again, a state advocacy committee in all 50 states. It's a group of, of essentially consultants, volunteers of the American Heart Association. They may be doctors or lobbyists or you know, somebody from the hospital association, somebody from the medical association, um, survivors, volunteers, you know, um, parents of kids with congenital heart defects. You know, it can be, it's a wide range of essentially advisors, but we don't prioritize more than essentially my rule of thumb is five things that go on our agenda. That's it. And it's exactly for that reason. It's capacity. We can't, we, I'd love to do everything. I'd love it if next year te Texas went smoke free and they pass mandatory pulse proximity screening for all newborns, and they pass mandatory physical education, and they did, I mean, I'd love it if Texas did that, but I have, one, I have Joel Romo, who's a lobbyist, he's great, we, could, we pay a little bit of a lobbyist, and we have a great network of volunteers, and so limited, and maybe, I don't know, I, he might have a $20,000 budget, I don't know, you know, so it's, you know, we have, it's just that. It's what can we, what do we, of all this range of things that we would love to do in Texas, what ultimately is the, the political will? What ultimately do we have the capacity to do it? You're right, the, the, the targets are so important. So again, if we find out that there's too many people standing between us and where we can get and that they're so powerful that the amount of resources we'll need. When, when we ran smoke free air campaigns in states, we probably spent, in tech, well in Texas last year, I, I'm sure we spent between the voluntary associations, a couple million bucks on smoke-free Texas. It's not cheap. You know, in Minnesota, we probably spent about $400,000 a year just on a smoke-free air law. These things, these campaigns aren't cheap when you're buying ads and you're having to pay lobbyists and all that. So a lot of it is, is that. That said, that's our agenda. Those are the things that we say we're either going to support or not. The final stage for us is that Midwest Academy process. We do no more than two campaigns per state. Um, and sometimes only one, but no more than two. And that, again, is because we know we have limited resources. And it gets really hard because when you, again, have this full range of opportunities, you know, going back to the beginning, um, 
you know, when you look at all the different issues that we prioritize, and you know, uh, well, um, I won't waste your time with that, but when you think about all the different things we could do and the things that we have to say no to, bringing that huge thing here down through that funnel of only two things um, is what we have to do in every state. But again, we, we've, we've just learned through time if we try to be all things to all people, we try to get it all done, we actually get nothing done. So, yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. that example we were, we were talking about. So you also want to see who else is advocating because you want to be careful about who your allies um, can be. It's not always a good thing. And that's extremely important. Um, there are two, the two things I often think about allies and, and coalition partners. They're again, those, who, those people who are your friends. So we, um, you know, I have what I spend, but w we always pool our money in our coalitions or pool our resources. And sometimes people come with no money. You know, we're, the Lance Armstrong Foundation in particular, now they sp have spent money in places like in Texas and now in California, but a lot of times they don't, they're new to advocacy, so they don't sometimes have the same budgets that we have in some states. Sometimes all they bring is just their, their, their network, and that's fine. That may be what they bring to that state. There are many organizations that have limited ability to spend money on lobbying, but there's something about, so that there's, we're, we're often looking for resources. The other advantage of coalition partners are unexpected allies. Those people that have a very different message. So I think everybody knows why the American Heart Association does what we do. Although I did have a member of the, of the Federal Ag Committee who thinks that we're asking for increased enforcement of FDA over tobacco products because we get money from the government. So some people question our motivations sometimes, even though we don't get government funding. But there's sometimes people question our motivations. Most people don't. But allies can be brought in just for new partners, just n a new perspectives on things. Um, March of Dimes, in I, I, they've been an organization where um, most people just think of them as just about birth defects, but there's a lot of other things they do. We've used them a lot on smoke fear, not used. We've had them as allies on smoke free air laws. They bring in a new set of constituents, new set of people to talk about things. Hospitals, that's another good ally. Hospitals are incredibly powerful and unexpected. They're major employers. They're, they've got, even if they don't put money into your campaigns, having a hospital, we did a really great ad in, um, in Ramsey County, City, St. Paul, Minnesota, uh, where we had every, ho there were a lot of hospitals there, we had every hospital administrator said sign a, sign a letter, full page ad in the St. Paul uh, 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 Pioneer Press from all the hospital administrators saying, as major employers in this place, in the city, we want the, the city council to go smoke free. So it can be about those, those pooling our resources, but it can also be about you know unexpected new allies. The Chamber of Kentucky, we're working on smoke free air in Kentucky. Cham Kentucky Chamber of Commerce has come out fully supportive. New ally, they're not giving us any money, but they're again a new messenger, a new ally that comes in, brings a new perspective, sh shakes people up a little bit when they say, yeah, we're used to heart, lung, and cancer coming in. Oh, but the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce, maybe this is um, a little bit different now. So, uh, questions or comments? Well, great. I wish you well as advocates. Again, if um, there's anything at all that I can do in any of these stages to be of assistance, um, would love to, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you.